at the centre of Scotland's largest city lies its beating heart. Glasgow Central Station is the transport hub that connects all our communities, with trains running from platforms both above and below ground. Up on the concourse, staff take on the daily challenge of keeping the whole nation moving, coping with delays. From well, 1908, it's been cancelled. We're going to always be special, just at a time when we need it. Crowds. That's the queue halfway down Hope Street. Coming down. Come on, guys, hurry up. And everything a busy station can throw at them. This is the biggest tour I've ever done. Come on, gather away. While in the tunnels beneath, an army of engineers are about to take on one of the biggest renovations this railway has ever seen. The last time the Argyle lines were closed, I wasn't even born. <laughs> this is going to be manic for eight weeks, 24-7. It is indeed the moment of truth. Bikes are going to fly. As new faces join the central team, they must all work together. If we could pull this off, it's got to be absolutely brilliant. To keep the trains on track and ensure that everyone reaches their destination safely. Something remarkable is happening at Glasgow Central Station, which hasn't been seen for a generation. After months of careful planning, today marks the beginning of a huge undertaking for both the station and the city's larger railway system. Where is it you're going to? I'm going to uh, downstairs. I'm going to work all. Right, so we have no services down the stairs. Um, let right. me just look for you. Glasgow Central sits on one of the country's busiest commuter routes, the Argyle Line, which runs through the station's low level. But for the next two months, this line will be closed as it undergoes one of Scotland's railway's largest renewal projects ever. Every day you've got to adapt. I've been here 40 years in the railway. Looking back, I can't remember a sort of project that's maybe closed the station likes at a low level for this length of time. This stretch of railway serves 48 stations, but for eight weeks, trains from Rutherglen to Exhibition Centre will be shutting their doors to the public for the first time in decades. It's a huge, huge bit of work that's not been done for years, so it is essential. Probably one of the busiest liner routes you know, in Scotland, and a huge amount of work to actually figure out how to keep those passengers moving. Serving over 5 million passengers a year, Glasgow Central's low level is the largest station on the Argyle Line. The closure will have serious repercussions for staff and passengers. That may have an effect on the high level because they'll be extending trains from the high level, which may mean additional footfall, particularly during the peak periods. It's the first night, so it's just getting a feel for what trains it is. Blackpool will be Blackpool being. It is, that's anyway. right, that's it. You can keep me right. There's still challenges we need to overcome, you know, and we're still working on that. It's about making sure that we can pull together and make sure everything goes to plan. The engineering team will have just eight weeks to deliver £32 million worth of renovations focused on three major goals. Replacing outdated rail tracks, repairing structural flaws in over four miles of tunnel, and a complete overhaul of Anderston Station, one stop along from Glasgow Central. Over 170 contractors will work around the clock to get the job done on time, and for many of them, this represents the opportunity of their careers. Among them is civil engineer Tom, who has come on board as one of the project managers. Are you working here? Are you coming to work here or what? No. Yeah. Oh, you are, Tim? I have come 14 kilometres, so it took me about half an hour, 35 minutes. It's good. I got cycled through Glasgow Green, and I don't need to go to the gym this morning. <laughs> Having risen up through the railway at a young age, Tom is excited to follow in the footsteps of his engineering heroes. I've not got my other bag. See, my non-site bag has a little sticker on it that's Brunel, and it says I'm an engineering giant because Brunel was like five foot five. And that's why I became a civil engineer anyway. It really is a once in a career opportunity to work in a blockade of this nature and make my mark on the railway. Tom and his colleague Nicola will be overseeing the complex rail track replacements, 
They'll be working closely alongside railway veteran Rod Henry, who will be overseeing the structural repairs of the many miles of tunnel under the city, including work on the longest railway tunnel in the whole of Scotland, which runs from Anderston to the old Glasgow Green Station. There's a dead rat on the forefoot on this side. Ah, it's like a macabre safari. Tom's meeting with the other team leaders to talk strategy and review the scale of what lies ahead. I think the last time the Argyle lines were closed, I wasn't even born there, <laughs> so, um, no, <laughs> so, sorry guys. Pretty embarrassing. My niece has started in my team and uh, my uncle Rod's been in the railway before I was born and I thought, mm, that's maybe not the badge of honour I want. <laughs> but this has only sort of happened twice in the past sort of 50 years. The Argyle lines are an arterial route through the centre of Scotland and they take, you know, they take all the commuter traffic and to close it is a really big deal, you know, and for eight weeks is, is quite an extensive piece of work. This is going to be manic for eight weeks, 24-7. As the assessment work begins, the team at Glasgow Central brace themselves for the knock-on effects of the low-level closure. Today's the first day of the closure, but it's been a lot of work this morning just to make sure the comms is right, staff all know where they should be positioned and what they're doing. Is anything else you need that would make it easier no, for you? No, definitely not. Right. And it should be the same drivers the whole day. I'll be yeah. a bit, I'll go and see how the trains are and come back out anyway. Serving over 14 million annual commuters, the eight-week closure will leave thousands of passengers in need of alternative travel plans, from replacement bus services to alternative rail travel. You can put all the planning and preparation in, but you're always thinking, have we missed something? No, it's closed. You can just walk to Anderson. No, I'm going down here. Right, you can get the real replacement bus from here. We've we'll got replacement buses that will pick up from Gordon Street outside the station, which is probably doubled in footfall just because of how people are traversing through now to get their trains. We've got staff who have been relocated from the low-level stations and other stations that are closed to the, the key points. And it's low-level veterans Tina and Lorraine who need to get passengers where they need to be. The difference for up here anyway to working down the stairs, you know yourself, you know what it's like. I know. It's different up here. Def I feel it dif oh, different I feel up it here. I feel it as well. 100% because Aye. down there my sights went because it's so dark. I feel like a mole mm -hmm. and up here in the nice bright sunshine. Do you know what I'm I mean? So not to laugh at you. I'll be quite good. <laughs> but as the rush hour approaches, one of the bus services has failed to appear. Well, as that's one delayed, actually. It says this would happen if it got busier, that it would get delayed. A replacement bus driver has got lost, and as he finds his way back ahead of peak time, Alison is handling communication issues inside. Guys, all I was closed. I know, I've seen that as well, people looking that way. I might stick an extra couple of barriers there. That's an issue, people keep trying to get out carriage drives. I'm gonna to need to get another poster made up, possibly, like no exit. Today and the first week's really gonna be the key times to educate people on how they get to their individual stations and the journey that they're trying to take. People don't realise how important it is to make sure the message is consistent. Right. Hopefully, a wee bit of direction. Meanwhile, back outside, the team have managed to find their missing bus driver just in time for rush hour. You're nearly away to Wellington Street. No, 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 no. Do you go up down West George Street to High Street and then down from the High Street there? That'd probably be your quickest way. And then up London Road. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. With new directions from the team, the buses are now back on schedule. Lovely job, well, that's us. Yeah. Another two down. I feel as though I don't, not actually Scott really anymore. I feel as though I work on the buses, like carry on the buses, what was her name? Tina, you know, that might have been before my time. Oh. <laughs> Do you know what, they're, they're an amazing team down there and how they've just reacted and turned about coming up to the high level to assist taking on board what needs to be done to deliver for customers and passengers. It just makes me really proud of them. As staff at Central deal with the pressures of the closures, the engineering teams have arrived out on the lines. People will ride the train and not necessarily know all the work that goes into maintaining it. Tom's team will need to tackle 19 renewal sites, 10 of which require replacing worn out concrete that sits below the metal track. The can and the weight going to that side, you can see why that this is this side that's failing as opposed to that side. So, yeah, how are these bolted in? Is there a pad under it or are they just drilled into the, the, oh, the cast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you can see that one that's come away. Yeah. 
At these points, known as breakout sections, the team need to lift the old track and smash out the concrete beneath before pouring in a stronger mix for the track to sit on top of. The force of the train moving through the rail deteriorates the concrete and that's why we need to come and replace it. But we'll wait until all of the sites are broken out and then we'll get the concrete um, uh, machines in. We'll need to keep an eye on the weather when we're doing the pour. I think it's five degrees. Five. Hopefully it's warm enough. Not only will the teams need to battle the elements to replace the concrete, they'll need to do it without moving the railway an inch. We've got to make sure that the rail is in the same position because it's close to the platform and it's on the slab as well and going through the tunnel, so alignment and geometry is a really important thing to get right. After inspecting the rail foundations, the team head deeper into the tunnel. You want to grab a roll first? I'm powered on uh, oats. Well, I had the haggis, black pudding, bacon, sausage and fried onion, well, grilled onion. Oh, you're making me jealous. I made it in the George Foreman in the office. And it's not just breakfast that Tom and Rod are split on. While Tom's attention is on the floor, Rod is more interested in what's above his head, heading up the structural repair teams throughout the Argyle tunnels. The main works will be concentrated on the two miles of underground between Bridgeton and Exhibition Centre. Years ago, um, when they ran steam trains, they encased the steel beams in concrete, and that concrete is aged and is now having to come off. They, they encased it in concrete to stop the, the steam, the embers pitting the steel, so the steam trains um, cause damage to the, the steel work, so they encased it in concrete. So this is a perfect opportunity now to take the concrete down and prepare the steel work. Quite a long tunnel and uh, every beam will need to be looked at. 24-7, 60 days, it's not going to be easy. With their assessments complete, the project leaders can instruct the heavy workload to begin. But over the coming weeks and months, they'll need to keep a close eye on the progress to ensure their plans don't veer off course. Back at Central, station manager Drew has a crisis on his hands and has had to phone emergency services. If you are calling about a seal, please press 1. If you are calling about a hedgehog, please press 2. For all other animals... Hello, Scottish SPCA, how can I help? Hello, this is Drew Burns, the stage manager at Glasgow Central. Just done a report, I've reported in about a trap pigeon in one of the units in Argyle Street. OK, no problem. OK, because it is a pigeon, so you know me. Pigeon Manor Central, need to look at it, need to investigate. With the pigeon trapped above a shop under the station, Drew needs to call in the maintenance team to assist. So, Greg, the situation is we have a trap pigeon in one of our retail units in Argyle Street. So we're going to have a look to see what we can do. It's a possibility we might need to cut through the wall to get to this pigeon. Of course, this, Drew. Anything this. for you. So you might need a step ladder. Step ladder. Torch, gloves, bingo. Pigeon rescue, we are on it. Come on. Okay. I'll get my lunch later. Come on. Come and grab it. We are the pigeon savers. <laughs> in about no more than five minutes. Once Greg gets his gear, we'll make our way around. And off operation Save the Pigeon starts. As long as you've got the light. I've got, so. oh, I see the light. All right. Now, a chap for the SSPCA, as you see, he's arrived, so... He's having a look, he's, he's spotted a pigeon, so it's whether he can get his, what do you call it, grab, the grabbers doing or a net down to try and catch it, so. Ta da! He looks as if he wants to kick me. Uh. <laughs> Hi. The pigeon is further into the wall than hoped, but the team are determined not to be beaten. It's just a wee bit out of reach. It's pretty awkward. <laughs> As they go. Thank you. No bother. Have you got any tips, Drew? Pigeon, pigeon must want tips. Sometimes if you sing a song, 
See if you sing. What kind of song? Well, it need to be something about Glasgow. Thankfully, before Greg can start his ceremony, the pigeon finally emerges unharmed. You're the man. You are. You're amazing. Well done. Let's see if it's a Glasgow, it's a Glasgow Central pigeon. Oh, guys, because it's the way you staying calm, you can tell it's for Glasgow Central. That was some job. Well done, you. Pull that back and then push it. It's just like that, obviously. <laughs> I need to put that in my CV now. One's caught a pigeon. That was some job. Well done. That was brilliant. I don't know how you would get it. Operation Pigeon Rescue Success. With one crisis averted, beyond the station at network control, the team are keeping an eye on a pressure point of their own. From their base in North Glasgow, Craig and his team oversee 2,800 miles of railway across Scotland, and the weather is a constant concern. As you can see here, this high pressure sitting out over Scandinavia. Over the next few days, that will start to come in towards the UK. More settled weather, uh, hotter weather, so that's the concern. Warm weather can cause the railway as much grief as cold winds and storms. The vegetation starts to grow and encroach in the railway. Uh, we can have hot rails, we can have the overhead lines uh, heating. But with the heatwave fast approaching, ground monitoring alone won't be able to survey the vast stretch of tracks. And that's one of the reasons this morning we are involving the helicopter team to do some inspections. A few miles from control is Cumbernauld Airfield, Network Rail's base for a dedicated helicopter service. I'm one of the old school railwaymen. I'm ex-British Rail, and I started by digging holes in the middle of the railway. 30-something years ago, uh, if somebody had said to me, Sean, you do realise you'll end up in a helicopter flying around surveying the railway, I would have told him to go away. Sean is a National Aerial Survey Specialist for Network Rail, covering the whole of Scotland from the borders to John O'Groats. We ring into control every morning uh, and speak to the control manager and then ask the, the very simple question, is there anywhere specific you'd like us to go? Hey, Network Rail Control, it's Sean with the helicopter at Cumberland. How are you doing this morning? We're a bit concerned uh, with the hot weather coming in, maybe some hot spots and encroaching vegetation. Could you head over to Motherwell, please? Uh, I want you just to sweep in from Motherwell to Glasgow via the West Coast Main Line. Just do some thermal imaging, some surveying, and uh, give us a call back if you have any issues you identify, please. We'll look at lifting in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes. With highs of 19 degrees expected over the coming days, Sean will need to check for anomalies caused by the increased temperature. The easiest and most cost-effective, safe way to um, get out and look at the railway in a different aspect is to use the helicopter. When we get to Glasgow, probably a couple of orbits around Central Station, and then back to Cumberland. OK, mission bus on, screen on, camera system on. Sean's surveillance sweep will be assisted by a state-of-the-art camera with the very latest thermal imaging technology. We can see the golfer getting his swing ready, and then we can switch it to thermal uh, visual. That was a rubbish shot. <laughs> Anything that's hot will show up as a white spot, and then we can zoom in on that to see if it's um, a fault on the overhead wires. Uh, start at Motherwell Station? Yes, please. OK, yeah. five miles to run. OK, mate, no worries. I just work our way along West Coast Main Line uh, through Uddingston, uh, Palmer D, and then round into Glasgow Central Station. And it's actually unseasonably warm for Scotland at the moment. It presents itself with some, some unique issues to the railway. With the heat beating down, even the smallest fault could threaten the entire rail network, making attention to detail vital. So if there's any problem on any one of those lines going into Central Station, you may think that's, you know, it's not much. It's actually a huge amount of uh, disruption. If we can find it now, the next time they've got an engineer's position, they can get out there, get it sorted before it becomes a problem to the travelling public. As Sean continues his sweep above, on the concourse below, the central team are about to tackle their biggest challenge yet, as they prepare for their first major event since the closure. 
Scotland to Poland tonight and it's the first event we've had since the Argyle line blockade came in. So it's going to be busier in general up in the high level. As soon as the guys come in, we'll get the count started. We'll just be free flowing the queue as we always do. Derek and John will just be taking the events manager. John will be the events manager, Derek assisting. Obviously, unfortunately, there was meant to be the Scotland-Ukraine match, so we had factored that in, and then the Ukraine match was, was cancelled. And it was a really short notice um, notification that Scotland would be playing Poland as a friendly instead. All right, ladies, what's happening here, Lee? Ladies, where? <laughs> well, Quines. <laughs> what does that mean? A Quines, a lady. Oh, that's OK. Our week of where Quine is... Uh... Quine. How great is it that you're... Your fellow Scots men and well, women uh, come down and you still the, learn. The country style of the I'm from Polish, my friend. I'm Poland. I'm living in Glasgow a few years. I'm working here. I live in here. And I'm going first time on a match Poland Scotland friendly, of course. Oh, that's brilliant. That's from both. Is that is the phone box yeah. in your garden as well? That's mine. I think a lot of people are going tonight to show their support, which is yeah. nice. You know, the fact that it should have been Ukraine. Sure. Play Ukraine. We play for Ukraine. We're trying to help these guys yeah. fight, yeah. Of course, my friend, of course. Enjoy the I night! Oh, hey! Enjoy the night, guys. Real friendship, it's all friendly. Heading up the event management is Glasgow Central veteran John Malley, and he's determined to get every single person to this important match on time. My 18th year doing events on here. 18th? 18th, I That's what you love for. You do this job, you love to work the events. The boys are uh, getting it done right, you know, if you... At 8 o'clock tonight, we've loaded everybody to the game. It's, it's good to know we've done it and everybody's got there safely. And we've still got peak time passes going up the road home. And as you can see, if you look at the queue, we're queuing quite, back, quite, quite a wee bit already. What is this line for? The hand and park football. Football? So you're not going to the football? We are. Do we have to buy our tickets? Do we have to buy our tickets? For a train? Yeah. Well, of course, yeah. Station manager Drew is helping manage the building queues. Getting all the fans to the game on time will be no easy task, and things are already starting to heat up. We just try to keep the queue moving as best as we can uh, between trains. With the game starting in less than two hours, the staff will need to manage fans and rush hour traffic already displaced from the low level, juggling them between trains to get them out of the station. I could take 100 up to platform three if you want to get trains 100 and that's 22 quickly. Roger, night. It's a front train. Guys, can you make me inside the coach? This will kill Ben within five, 10 oh, minutes. Great. Hopefully. <laughs> But there's an issue. With unexpected numbers coming out to show their support, the football crowd is beyond what staff had predicted from projected ticket sales. Never real one to all concerned. That's the queue down to the Hope Street gate again. Any chance to get any more on? Right, uh, the rear two are quite busy. One's jam fire, a normal day, never mind with football on it, mate. Because of the Anderson closure, this is the problem we've got now. Do you know, it's the time of day, so it's, it's evening peak. The train services that normally go to Mount Florida were now taking passengers from the low level. Luckily, they have contingency plans in place with extra trains known as specials on standby to help ease the pressure of the low level platform closures. So keep coming through then, got a ticket there. Good, good, here they come. With their time window closing, they'll need to act fast. Lorraine, have you cut that queue down there? Go on, Dirk. Send another 50 up to number, number 50. If number eight crowds, you can. We'll get them on that. 314 cut them here. Just give them 150 up, will you? Right, guys, platform three, just have your tickets ready to show going through, OK? Well, I actually queuing outside the station now. You just queue away right along the, the wall here on the right-hand side, please. With the queue building and the clock still ticking, now is the perfect time to make use of one of these additional train specials. Do you want me to start sending some up to the special now if you're up there? But John has just received some very bad news. Hey. Well, 1908 has been cancelled. We're going to lose our special just at a time when we need it. Because after the potential before the match starts, we could have been doing that. The team are a driver down, so the special train won't be going anywhere. As the platform staff react to the news, Drew holds the fort outside. Just need to ground our game, please. Hey, what's the problem? It's too busy. It's just around the corner. It's too busy. Ah, 
Try and move in a bit to the right hand side, please. The team will now need to think fast if they want to get all the fans over to the match on time. As part of the Argyle line closure, a number of stations will be undergoing major renovation works, and nowhere is seeing more of a transformation than Anderston Station, sitting just down the line from Glasgow Central. Manager Stewart is visiting the site today to check in with foreman Jimmy about the work that needs to be done. I've ripped out all the, all the station offices out, yeah? Everything all right downstairs? Go through here. Yeah. Opened in 1896 by the Glasgow Central Railway, the station has seen a number of changes over the years, including being swallowed by the immense Kingston Bridge flyover in the 1970s. For Anderson, this will be a big cosmetic uplift as well as an improvement of the infrastructure that keeps the railway running. So if you come through, you'll see what was the old ticket office. So the old ticket office was in here, um, and it was quite dated. And there's also issues with water management in this station. So a lot of the water comes into the station. So they've had issues here. So it's a full upgrade for this, uh, the Scotland Railway team that are going to be based in here. And the team have already started tearing out the old station to make way for the new additions. How much has been taken out now, Jim? That's us up to about 50%. Right. 50%. Uh, there was about 150, 160 tonne excavated out of this, this hole. So that's, the original, that's the original foundation stones for the station here, isn't it? That is, aye. Yeah. So that's 1890 or something, is it? As the cladding gets pulled off the walls, you can see all the different layers of construction. It's, it's quite interesting when you see it all peeled back like that, because you can see the, the original pillar, which would be 1890s, and you can see the paintwork on the top there, still the old paintwork and that beam would be the original beam. Then it's been built up and upgraded over the years, so um, there's kind of layers of maintenance and improvement that have been done. So part of the design is to try and work around the existing steel work. The real challenge is actually the logistics. It's getting the material in, because we've got the Kingston Bridge above, we've got the slip road either side of the station, so you can't deliver materials to the site. We're kind of boxed in here and there's nowhere to go, so we have to build everything in a in, a, in an unusual way. The new station will require new foundations, and for that, the team need to get several tonnes of concrete to this hard-to-reach site. So concrete this weekend and finish this off next week and then ready for the, the uh, cutting work. the slab and the steel work. Yes. But how are you going to get the concrete in for the walls? The team will use a pump to transport the concrete from the mixer 40 feet across the motorway, an operation that comes with major risks. Pumping concrete that far, over about 40 metres like that, there could be a good chance that the line could block. Steel pipes would get choked up. That means stripping every, every section to find where it was choked, take a bit of time, eh? concrete could end up going off. The weather itself, if it's really hot, it could go off quite fast as well. And then obviously you've got the problems if pipes get choked up. Anderson's unique circumstances leave the team with no choice, and Baker, an engineer working on the project, is on site to oversee the operation. Because it's going through a pump, it needs to achieve a certain fluidity. So what we'll do, there's a test that we do for that, which is a slump test. It's like a cone. You'll see in a minute when he starts it up. But so it's just like two cones he's got. He places that concrete into it and then measures it off that. A slump test usually measures the strength of concrete. But in this case, it is being used to ensure the mix will travel through the pipes. Once they remove the metal cone, They'll measure how quickly the pile droops and will need a height reading of between 80 and 180 millimetres. Without it, they'll need to abandon the plan or risk clogging the pipes. The test comes back with a reading of 130, well within the safety margins. That's fine. With the mix just right, the pump can begin. The schedule means they only have one shot and there's no going back. So obviously we just need to go down and check, make sure everything's in place. You know what it's like with the blockages? Yeah, and especially stretching over a 40 metre pipe there. And you can hear that sound, you know, that's just the concrete flowing. As you can see, there's no spills, which is always a good sign, because if there's a spill, that means you have a leak. It might be potential to actually cause a blockage. 
Another big risk with pumping concrete this far is the development of air bubbles, which could lead to irreparable damage, so the team have a special machine to help combat the issue. What you're hearing them is actually trying to do the poking, which is getting all the air bubbles out of the concrete and doing a continuous pour all around. This is a critical moment because we're, A, it's like baking where you, you know, you have a mould and our mould is set, you know, to the right standards, to the right level. If anything changes or you have a slippage in terms of the formwork, that changes the shape. And because of the concrete, um, once it's set, it goes hard. That means we actually have to break it out. So we really don't want to do that. If the team have miscalculated a single detail and the pour fails, it could set their schedule back days, threatening the entire project. You'd have to strip out and restart new levels. Everything would need to be tidied up. You're probably maybe putting a week, up, week behind on the programme, or two weeks behind on the programme. But as the operation continues, Baker can see some light at the end of the tunnel. I can see the concrete from here, which means it's coming up quite good. And, and uh, yes, continuous flow. The concrete itself, we've poured about 70% of it now to the top of the, the wall. So the next move will be is level off against the angle flat, which will be the finished height. So we're, we're, it's going good. With the last of the concrete coming through, the pump has been a success and the team can breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah, that's a good day's work. Peeling back the layers of Anderston Station has revealed fascinating relics of the past. And while line closures have brought challenges for the railway, it's also provided a rare opportunity for Glasgow Central's history buff Paul to investigate the forgotten story of Glasgow's low level. He's descended to the closed tracks to meet Jim Summers, an ex-railwayman and historian who once played a key role in the shaping of the Argyle Line. I was involved in the reopening of this line we're talking about. Ultimately, I became the operating manager for Scotland. It must be great to come back here and see this again. I get a huge kick out of it. And you know, Paul, you, you never lose the railway. It's, it's in your blood. When we look back to the times of the Industrial Revolution and particularly further on, say, the 1880s, when the Clyde itself was covered in ships. Tell me a wee bit what this area looked like. You'd have been standing here in amongst an awful lot of wagons and an awful lot of shunting movement. In fact, you wouldn't be standing here at all because it was just full of activity. The line along here was built to get access to the Queen's Dock primarily, which was over there. And that's why a lot of these wagons would be down here serving the docks with all these exports. The, the place was thriving. Once known as the workshop of the world, Glasgow's industry attracted business from across the globe, with the connecting railway playing a key role, fueling business rivalries that shaped the separate networks we see today. It was all about making money, frankly. The railway companies were always looking to exploit new facilities and, and make money. They were very, very prosperous. Seeking their fortune on the Clyde, the Caledonian Railway Company constructed the original low-level line between Glasgow Central and the river in direct competition with the other networks. The Caledonian Railway wanted to get part of the action and that was a network quite independent from the big rival, which was the North British Railway. They, they had their underground line through Queen Street low level and frankly, they, they didn't like one another. It was very much to uh, do the other chap down and uh, make your own money. The low level station in Glasgow Central and what we have above, I don't think people realise it was two separate entities for such a long period of time. Yes, it was two separate entities, a separate station master and, and everything. Yes, what you had here below Argyle Street was really quite a big self-contained Network. Well, we take a look at and see what we can find these tunnels then. Yes, well, I'm... Maybe a wee bit of reminiscing, we can do that. I'm looking forward to this because this is a most interesting area. Building a railway that sliced through the heart of Scotland's industrial capital was no easy feat, requiring extraordinary engineering that put Scotland on the map at the height of the Victorian era. What an amazing piece of Victorian engineering. The Victorians never cease to amaze me, Jim. This is a marvel and a tribute to these men in Victorian times that built these wonderful tunnels. 
Well, it's a very interesting part of the construction because you have two tunnels here converging. Uh -huh. And it aroused a great deal of interest in the engineering world at, at the time. But guys had to work in these tunnels and maintain the track, maintain all this brickwork. Imagine dark, the smoke and all the rest of it. Long days, hard work and dangerous. What a testament to them, isn't it, that it's still here? Yes, yes, and has lasted pretty well. Yep. I think it's quite easy to imagine the steam engines coming through here and how dense the smoke must have been and the dirt and the smell. You, could, you can still smell it down here. Oh, yes. One man who remembers the original low level is Albert Gregg, whose family has worked the railway for generations. The railway has been in the family since 1881. My dad was in the railway and his dad was in the railway right through the Caledonian days. Albert was a teenager when he worked on the low level at the height of the Caledonian days, yet he still remembers it like it was yesterday. It was another world, waiting from daylight and down the stairs behind me to Dante's Inferno, into murky conditions, and then into almost total darkness. It was another world. But those days weren't to last, and as industry in the Clyde faded, so too did the underground railway lines that served them. By the 1960s, over 4,000 miles of railway had been closed across Britain. And in 1963, Dr Beeching published a report recommending the closure of a further 5,000 miles of railway track. The Glasgow Central low-level line was among them. This is my own personal logbook. That's the last train, the journey of the last train. Saturday the 3rd of October, 1964. That was the year the line finally shut its doors, alongside Central's famous Victorian platform and dozens of other hidden railway routes and tunnels across the city. You know, people were moving out of the city, shipyards were finishing, Glasgow was in big transition. But all was not lost for the hidden network of the low-level rail tracks. Glasgow had some awareness of all the lines that were being closed, and maybe one of these days they would be valuable. Funnily enough, it's time came again. People have come back to the city and they're, they're surrounded by office blocks. Things have changed. So 15 years later, it, it reopened. Like, who would have thought it? In 1979, Glasgow Central Low Level reopened its doors for the people of Glasgow, but despite its return, many other lines and tunnels still lie dormant beneath the city to this very day. Do you think in the future then that if the city expands again, then we can utilise these areas? Oh yes, there are a number of tunnels all over Glasgow and they're a huge asset. Let's exploit them. People should stay aware of these possibilities and use them if the moment comes with new developments in different areas. It's a changing situation, and to me, it gives me great pleasure to see this circle turning. The history of Scotland's railway has always captured the imaginations of people passing through Glasgow Central, evident on Paul and Jackie's famous history tours, which are now bigger and busier than ever. Are we good to go? Does anybody have any questions before we start? Right, let's get going. The tours are full. Full. Used to be during the week, there would maybe be a few spaces, but we are full. The team is dealing with high expectations and a backlog of ticket sales from the pandemic. And with the closure of the low level, they've lost access to their star attraction. Already 2022 has been a challenge because we're hit with the tunnel work that closed the Victorian platform. And that's a big hit for us on the tours. It's a really popular part. So Paul and I have been working hard to make sure that our reputation is enhanced, not people walking away thinking, feeling as though they've been cheated. Jackie is determined to find the museum a boost, a new star item to impress the crowds. So I've got my scrounger head on and I'm now scrounging pieces, so... Um, calling in lots of favours, contacting lots of people to say, do you have a spare bit of this or a spare bit of that? Jackie has recruited Head of Maintenance Stevie to help find an item with the wow factor, although she doesn't yet know what that item could be. Sometimes I do chance my arm. There is no doubt Stevie will tell you that I do chance my arm. But 
Well, my mother always used to say, if you don't ask, you don't get. Their hunt begins just south of Central. Oh, it's cleaner than I expected. Yes, don't be fooled. So was this a signalling centre that covered what? West of Scotland, or...? Uh, uh. The old Glasgow Central signalling tower was once a bustling hub of activity, coordinating hundreds of trains in and out of Central throughout the 80s and 90s, until its final closure in the early 2000s. The abandoned floors are brimming with memories off the railway, and Jackie's determined to find something that stands out. So I think if you're doing a job like that, it's good to have eyes on with you. I think so. Aye. Look at the views, you can see right away. I know. It's a, it's a lovely day. That's the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> ah, this is the bit that I've seen. At the top of the tower lies a signalling desk. This was once the beating heart of Glasgow's railway network. And Jackie might just be in love. Oh, my goodness. So these are like, see the, see the big board that I've got in the museum? That's like a bigger version of that. Well, you get a model rail set, that one you've got. <laughs> no, it's no. <laughs> it comes out as real. Nobody's getting to see it up here. Taking it to the, or some of it to the museum would be wonderful because it would open it up to the public and let other people see it. Because on the tour, we don't do a lot about the technical side and the rail track and all the rest of it. But we don't cover any of that. I might need to go to signalling classes. Uh -huh. So you can talk the talk? Uh huh. Right, yeah. Very funny. Aye. No, you I can't don't just start going, yes, well, 1973. <laughs> well, I think you're talking about. <laughs> Given the gargantuan size of the signalling desk, Stevie is keen to steer Jackie's interest towards other potential items. You could take a photo of that and see if that's of any interest. That's an old vending machine. I take it there's no cans left in it. Well, we took them out. <laughs> see, if you just keep looking, just sometimes you pick up a wee gem. A couple of wardrobes if you're wanting a wardrobe. A wardrobe? Somebody's betting slip. <laughs> I wonder if they would pay out in that in case it's a winner. <laughs> But in the end, despite ransacking the building top to bottom, there's really only one item that Jackie has eyes for. Take a couple of pictures of this to see. I need to know what's covered by the railway heritage. Much to Stevie's growing apprehension. It'd be wonderful to take the whole thing, but if we were able to get one of these, because I think one section's as much as we could take. That's solid. For you to take a section of that, hypothetically... No! <laughs> Let me finish! Jackie's convinced transporting and repairing the almost two-ton signalling desk should be a piece of cake. So, look, I've just made that back. I repaired that. Oh, and I don't know anything. I put that. That was out and I put that back. Good for you. So it's not that hard. If we took one section of it, took it over, and then we had that. And just draw in wee bits? No, no. Logistically, mm. no chance. Well, a challenge, no? Mm-hmm. You've never let me down before. Yeah, but well, this is the first. And there'll be... <laughs> and there'll be the last. Come on, I think we'll give up. But despite her best efforts, Stevie is pretty set in his final answer. Not happening. It's How a definite it no. It's, it's always a definite no. I'm just, Everything's I'm always just a definite shooting the breeze. No. Everything's always a definite no until... I'm just killing time. We, we get to the point where Stevie actually doesn't like to get beaten either. On this occasion, I don't mind. <laughs> the trip has not been the success story that Jackie was hoping for. She'll have to look elsewhere to find an item with her wow factor. And as she continues her search, staff on the concourse are still dealing with the increased passenger numbers from the low-level closure. And shift supervisor Alison has an unexpected arrival. We got a call from um, no, one of ScotRail staff to say that a Ukrainian family oh, were on our streamline arrival. But I think this is the first time we've had this, we've been prepared for it. Since the war in Ukraine began, staff at Central have been making preparations for a possible influx of refugees through the station, and this family is their first arrival. The Ukrainian family are passing through Glasgow Central on their way to London, and it's up to Alison to make sure they make their connection safely. Uh, uh, London, they've got, I think they've got people there. We're literally just Google Translate because nobody's got any Ukrainian or English. <laughs> so. Mandarin's not a good either. No, no. <laughs> I'll let you up here, there. Yeah, 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 I'll take them along, yeah. When's it? I think it's in the night. Do you want five minutes? 
But since the family don't speak English, making sure they get to the right place could prove to be a challenge. Guys, we'll go this way. Yeah. Yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's OK, come on. Yeah. Luggage in there. <laughs> but despite the language barriers, Alison gets the family on board the train on time and ready for the journey ahead. That's thank you, thank, thank you. That. You're very thank welcome, you. very yeah. welcome. OK, take care. The family may have departed, but Alison's job isn't over. As the train makes its way to London, she must make sure the staff at Euston know what's coming. So every train's got a head code that identifies it. Number 31 to base. Can I get a head code, Devon, for the uh, 1540 Euston departure, please? That was one mic, one six. Thank you. Armed with the train's unique identification number, Alison must now try to make contact with London staff. Hi there, it's Alison at Glasgow Central. Um, I have an assist, but they're also a Ukrainian refugee family. There's four passengers, but there's one of them that's elderly that would um, really need a buggy, if possible. Um, they're in, yep, they're in one mic, one six. Got quite a bit of luggage. That would be really appreciated, I think, just a buggy for heart and obviously a wee bit of help for where they're, they're going to. OK, thanks very much. Bye. Now, London, no, and hopefully they'll meet them and give them the same service that Glasgow gave them. With everything now in place, Alison has made sure the family will be well looked after on the journey ahead, even their furry friend. They had a dog, so I went and bought them dog treats for the shop because that's the one thing we didn't have. <laughs> we don't really have it in the station, so we went and get dog treats and a wee dog toy. <laughs> Peasant from Central. <laughs> High above the railway, Sean continues to hunt for potential faults in the midst of the heat wave. He's on the lookout for hot spots on the overhead lines, which could disrupt the smooth running of the railway. If you bring me round over this tower block, we'll do. I'm steering the camera with this thumb here, you can zoom in and out with this thumb here, select what sensor I'm in. You should see me on Call of Duty, I'm amazing. <laughs> um, I'll fire the laser, that will lock it to that spot. I'll ask Dave to put an orbit in, and even though we're going round, the camera will not move off that spot. As they continue the sweep, Sean thinks he might have spotted something. Oh, there it is, right there. OK, so we've got a potential hotspot here on the return conductor. Dave, if you could put an orbit in here for me, please. That'd be That's fantastic. Well. I'll have a look at this. As we put the orbit in, if the fault disappears, we know it's the sun reflecting on it. Um, but if it doesn't, uh, then we'll, what we'll do is we'll zoom in deeper and have a look and see if we can actually identify what the problem is. If Sean has found what he thinks he's found, it could have catastrophic consequences for the entire network. Worst case is that this actually is a fault, um, so there it is there. Um, if this burns through and melts, that means that return conductor will fall down, which means there'll be nowhere for the, the current that's finished that goes through the rails to go back, which means that's a potential um, showstopper for the railway. We would be straight on the phone uh, to control, to get the line blocked, to get this rectified via an emergency possession. Luckily, on this occasion, it's a false alarm. Looking at this, it looks like it's just the sun reflecting off the insulator. The sun's in the angle there, so it's coming in this way, reflecting onto it. And just to confirm, yeah, so as we come round, now we've blocked the sun out, we can see that it's not showing warm. From the investigation we've done from up here, I'm confident now that that's not a fault, that's not, a, not an issue for the railway. Satisfied with the results, Sean can finally head back to base. It's better for us to, to be sure and confident that it's not a fault by doing a thorough investigation from up here. The trains can still keep running, but we can still inspect the railway quite safely. As Sean finishes his sweep of the city, Jackie is still on the hunt below for a star addition to the station tours, and now she has her sights set on an old signalling box in Barhead dating back to 1894. Electrification will soon centralise signalling to control in North Glasgow, rendering this signal box obsolete, and Jackie is determined to mark her territory.
So the plan is that we take everything from Barhead signal box because it'll all be obsolete because the, the line's being electrified. And we take that and we bring it and put it in to create our very own signal box. However, her plans will again require the cooperation of the head of maintenance, Stevie. Right. I'm thinking maybe I just a quick lift and shift and make these things sound so easy. I'm practicing for speaking to Stevie. <laughs> Look at this. How good is that? really like the look of this old desk. This looks as though it's been here from the year dot. It says 1915. And look at the patina and just the wear. That's like your old school desk, isn't it? <laughs> My slate. <laughs> you speak for yourself, I know that old. But this time, it's the original lever set that has captured Jackie's imagination. So we've got these things in the, see these wee disc things? I've got loads of them in the museum. You need to do them in an order. So these wee things here tell you what order you need to do them in. It's incredible that this is still getting used. It's like something like an old film, isn't it? It really is. The real <laughs> children. Movie. The real children. <laughs> You're showing your age. <laughs> it's actually better than I expected. I love it. Great to have it in the station. But if Jackie wants the lever set for the tours, then Stevie will have to be convinced. The big question is, Stevie, is it a, a possibility? Well, the stuff for the signal centre is a big no. I know, I know. This, eh, uh, do you think it'll fit? We'll make it fit. Um, <laughs> I don't think that'll fit. I know. I think I'm amazed by how deep it goes. Well, that's what I said to you mm -hmm. before we come up here. It's twice the size underneath. Yeah. Are you expecting the whole thing or just a section? Eh, uh, no, no, as much as I can get. I love this kind of framework look. How they said in Jaws, you need the bigger boat. We're going to need a bigger van. Uh -huh. The outlook isn't looking positive, but this time Jackie is determined to fight her case. Apparently, I've just found out that the the, the signal box is getting knocked down. Is it? Eh? The whole build, this this old building is getting knocked down, which is heartbreaking. I mean, this is part of history, so we need to make sure that we're keeping it for the future. Everything that's here, I really would look to take as much of what's here as possible. Is it? It could be doable. Certainly, yeah, we'll get a good, give it a good go. Thanks. See, yeah. I knew you would come round to the, my way of thinking. I can see this. I can see me standing where so Mr. John's cap ah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pulling these levers. You make an old woman very happy. Doing that for a minute me. ago, you weren't that old. <laughs> I knew I could persuade him to do it. I knew I could persuade him. It'll look great. It'll look a big, great addition. Just always likes to say no and then dangles the carrot and then, and then, da -da! and it makes him look really good as well because he says, Oh, this is a really hard job. Don't know if we can manage it. And then he does it. He does it all the time. So I think it's a plan that he has. Jackie has secured the new addition to the tours that she's been needing, all thanks to the help of the maintenance team. I think they quite enjoy doing all the stuff for the museum. I keep telling myself every time. Back at Central, Drew is holding the fort outside as the team battle to get the football fans to the game on time. Due to an unexpected turnout, combined with displaced rush hour crowds and a train cancellation, things are now hanging in the balance. Everybody at one, to all concerned, that's the queue halfway down Hope Street. But they cancelled the special service for the football in 1908. Oh, it only takes one domino effect here for it to go through. If something fails, it'll probably about two or three hundred fans left behind there. Hundreds of fans could now potentially miss this symbolic match. However, that is not something that Derek King is about to let happen. This job we do as a duty manager in here is this a problem solver. And that's what you do all day from the minute you start to the minute you finish. Derek has been learning his craft on the platforms of Central for over 12 years, and he's already set a plan in motion that might just save the day. Why don't you tell me that's a good tie-up? This is getting bored up. Oh, I've got some other people in there. Derek's plan is to assemble another train, taking two three-car trains and attaching them together, essentially doubling the capacity, if they can do it on time. 
just let you know, we've got a 1905 Nielsen 6 car, but that should clear most of that traffic yeah, you've got down there once we get that boarded. Just tying up in 10, hopefully. As soon as that's a good to attach, I can get it boarded, but I just need to be sure I attach successfully. As I'm saying, Lorraine just give me a wee minute, we're just in the process, just now, make sure it's a good tie up. As soon as it attaches, we'll try and load it as much as we can. Derek seems to like might clear it. Well, the file's here, so he makes sure the place and he checks it with the driver, makes sure it's a good touch. Once we go and we get continuity with the doors, they get the doors all open, we're good to board it. And I'll board it there and we get everybody through here. Just in preparation, going to open some of the gates. I'm about a minute away from boarding this, it's going about 600 people, and they've all got six minutes to go on this train in number 10. Will you take us up walk through for me, please? Can I show you your tickets and walk through? That should clear most of that queue, so that just leaves a couple of stragglers, hopefully. Two minutes we'll have this all boarded, it'll be busy. How about me good? Scotty, I'll three to Lorraine and John in the base. We can board that Nielsen number 10. Hold train! Caviar at the front, the reels at the back. <laughs> Derek's quick thinking is particularly impressive, considering what else has been on his mind this evening. Claire's all right. Oh, I just that's why I'm a bit more relaxed. <laughs> what can I tell you? I know, but you still your daughter, isn't it? I'm still panic. I'm going to be a grander. Oh, so I'm a grander, sorry. Daughter just had a wee bit of illness after it, and she's fine, she's all sorted. So I got a nice phone call about half past five, quarter to six. Everything was great, and I'm a happy grander. You know what I mean? So, I'm here for the camera. Max, thinking about you. <laughs> That's how you do it. With the operation a success, all the fans will now make it to the game on time. John, I wish I could say it's been a pleasure, but... <laughs> as soon as the cat gets the figures, we'll know exactly how many we took. I want to know, I want to know. Because I felt busy, you know, I felt... I, I, 6,000, maybe. 5,060. <laughs> Cat. 5,000. Ah. I was doing it then. Ah. That's a pretty good crowd for a midweek game. More than expected. I'd love to be at Hamden myself tonight because I think the atmosphere would be quite emotional. It's because of what we're going through just now. It's not a nice world that we're living in, but we all have to communicate the right message. They'll come back tonight, they'll be full of the joys, either the results, it doesn't really, I think the results are important tonight. Next time on Inside Central Station. The worst thing you can have is two queues in the middle of the station where they're facing each other. That then becomes a class point. So that's why you segregate them. Right, guys, straight through the gate. So this is Marvin. We just get his harness on to begin with, and it's just a mental trigger for starting working, and uh, the carry-on stops. At least that's the theory.